So in this video, we'll look at six different S-Corporation problems, and this is meant to be a continuation of the S-Corporation basics video. So let's jump right in. Problem one, would Tamron Corporation, a domestic corporation, qualify to make a valid subchapter S election under the following alternative situations? So what you're going to see in problem one, it's going to focus on one of the four requirements to be an S-Corporation, and we'll go through those in each situation. So in situation A, Tamron Corporation has 101 individual shareholders, all of whom are unrelated except that two of them are husband and wife. So this gets at the requirement that to be an S corporation at the time of this video, the number of shareholders must be equal to or less than 100 shareholders. Now when looking at this rule, you're allowed to attribute family members as one specific shareholder. Now, spouses are always considered one shareholder. So here we have 101 individual shareholders, all of whom are unrelated, except two of them are husband and wife. So that means that the 101, counting the husband and wife, well, husband and wife are considered one shareholder, so really we have 100 shareholders. So we are good. Now, this is assuming we meet all the other requirements. So let's go to B. In B, Tamron Corp has 101 individual shareholders, all of whom are unrelated, except two of them are parent and child. So we have a parent and child relationship. The rule is six degrees of separation with respect to family members. So if we look at parent and child, right, we have the child, we have the parent, that's one degree of separation, just that arrow between. So that's one degree, and that means that 101 shareholders, including parent and child, actually ends up being 100 because parent and child are viewed as one and we are within that requirement. So let's go now to C1. In C1 we have the same corporation, 101 unrelated individual shareholders except two of them are remote cousins whose grandmothers were sisters. So again we're looking at the six degrees of separation and this one we're going to have to draw out. So I like to call the two remote cousins X and Y. So we've got X and we've got Y, so we have the parent of X. Let me redraw that out there, give us some more room. So again, we've got X and Y. We've got the parent of X. We've got the grandparent of X, okay? And then the grandparents are sisters. We've got grandparent of Y. We've got the parent of Y, and then we have Y. So we have one, two, three, four, five degrees of separation. So we are within the hundred, I'm sorry, we are within the six, and that makes the two cousins one shareholder, so that's actually 100. The next question, C2, Tamron has 150,000 shareholders, each of whom, um, each of which belongs to a family, one of 99 different families, and the families can trace their ancestry back to one single great, great, great great grandparent all right so with the six degrees of separation we know that grandparents and the respective shareholder are two degrees right because you have the child to parent parent to grandchild uh, i'm sorry parent to grandparent my apologies that's two levels every level of great is then one additional above that so we got great that's three we have another great that's four, another great that's five, and another great is six. So we are within six. So the 99 shareholders, even though it's 150,000, it's all viewed as 99 because they're all viewed as the same family, and we're within the 100 uh, and f or fewer requirements. So let's go to D1. So in D1, we got Tamron Corp. Has one shareholder of record, Lemon, a U.S. citizen who's married to Lime, a Mexican citizen. And the stock was issued while they were married. Lemon and Lime live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So this question gets at the requirement that all shareholders be U.S. residents or um, um, U.S. residents or U.S. citizens. So of course, Lemon is a U.S. citizen, but Lime is a Mexican citizen. Now they reside in Santa Fe. So assuming that Lime is a U.S. resident because of Lemon being married, right, to a U.S. citizen, this is fine. Now here's the issue, by the way. The issue is, well, Lemon is the owner, but New Mexico is a community property jurisdiction. So everything owned by Lemon is owned equally by Lemon and Lime. 
So therefore, it makes Lime now treatable as an owner, and because they reside in the U.S., Lime is considered a U.S. resident since married to Lemon, and therefore, this will be fine. So Lemon and Lime are both U.S. citizens or U.S. residents, and we're good. So that's not an issue. But what in two? What happens if in two, in Mexico City, Mexico, same as uh, one, but Mexico City. So Mexico, under Spanish law, that um, origin, also has community property, which again, lemon and lime, but now lime is no longer a U.S. resident. So what do we do here? Yes, lemons is still a U.S. citizen, but what about lime being a non-U.S. resident, U.S. citizen? Well, there's a special rule. The special rule is when one spouse, okay, when one spouse is a U.S. citizen resident An election for this S corporation rule can apply to the other spouse to make him or her be considered um, eligible to be a shareholder. So if Lime and Lemon make this election, they are good. And let's assume they do. Now here's the issue. Here's the catch: is that this opens Lime up to other income tax issues out there, makes Lime subject to other taxation issues. So you gotta think about that. But if we make the election, we're good. If we don't make the election, that's bad, and we can't have an S corporation. Okay, E. Tamron has 10 equal shareholders, 9 are individuals, and the 10th is a general partnership. So right there, boom, we cannot be an S corporation. So in 1, A, B, C, D, all those situations, I have a check mark because we can get S corporation status. But E, we fail because you cannot have an entity as an owner of an S corporation. All right, let's go to number 2. We have cantaloupe, honeydew, and watermelon, all of whom are resident individuals, and they're planning to form Melon Corp. Assuming that Melon otherwise qualifies to be an S corporation, to make an S election, which of the following alternative capital structures affect Melon's corporation eligibility? So this question is going to get at the one class of stock requirement. The one class of stock requirement. So in A, Cantaloupe and honeydew each receive voting common stock. Watermelon will receive non-voting preferred. Uh-uh, you can't have this. And the reason why is because, remember, you have to have one class of stock. You can have differences with respect to voting, but you can't have differences with respect to um, distribution. And preferred stock, by its nature, has differences in distribution to common. So A fails. What about B? Cantaloupe and honeydew each receive voting common. Watermelon receives non-voting common. This is fine. You can have differences with respect to voting and non-voting common. That's fine. C. Cantaloupe and honeydew each receive voting common. Watermelon receives voting preferred. It's preferred. If you see any preferred, you can't be an S corporation by its nature. As preferred stock always has a um, a preference. That's why it's called preferred stock. It's preferred to common, and the main preference is with respect to distribution and liquidation. We focus on distribution. So let's go to problem three. So 3A, Tropical Fruit Corp was formed on March 1st of the current year by coconut, mango, and guava, all of whom are U.S. resident citizen individuals. So here's situation or question one. By what date must Tropical Fruit Corp make an election if it wants to be an S corporation? So they formed on March 1st. And the rule is, hey, if you want to be an S corporation in the current year, the first year, you have to um, elect S corporation status two and a half by two and a half months after the, the starting point. So we count the full month of March is one month, full month of April is two months, and then halfway through May. So we must make the election by May 15th of the current year. How is the election made? Okay, we file form 2553, and we have to have 100% consent on the day that the election is made by all the shareholders to be an S corporation. All right, number three, if a valid S election was made on March 5th, which, hey, that would fall it between March 1st and May 15th of the current year, what would be the effect of Guava, right, one of the owners, selling her shares to Papaya on May 15th? There would be no effect because, again, the rule is you file Form 2553. You need 100%. Um, to, uh, all owners have to agree, consent to be an S corporation. If somebody later sells it, 
It's too bad. Under They'd have to be disclosed. It would be an S corporation. The election was made, but there's nothing that that affects. Now, this might affect when you have a revocation of a termination later on, but not when you elect. All right, problem four. We have Barry Corp, which has a valid S election in effect for several years. Goji owns 40% of the stock. Huckle, Juniper, Rasp, and Straw each own 15% of the stock. All shareholders are U.S. resident citizen individuals. So A, how can Barry Corp revoke its S election for the current year? All right, so to revoke the S corporation election, and we're, let's assume that this is the beginning. Right, this is on January 1st, the current year. Let's assume they're a calendar year. Okay, this is calendar year. So, for this business, for the S election to take, a fa take effect in the current year, let's assume they're a calendar year again and we're on January 1st, then Barry Corp must make its election by March 15th of the current year. And the reason why is that 2.5 month rule. Now, another thing is that you have to have more than 50% of the owners agree to this specific election. Now, this, there's no form for this, but you would file a statement with the respective uh, 1120S for the year. Okay, B, how can Barry Corp revoke its S election for the subsequent year? So similar to A, um, the key here, though, is with respect to the date. We can make this election any time during the current year and up until 315 of the next year. Again, assuming we're calendar year and we're on 1-1 one, one right now. And it's still the 50 more than 50% requirement and the election and all that stuff. C, if Barry Corp revokes its election for the current year, when can Barry Corporation make a new effective subchapter S election? So if we revoke our S Corporation status, we terminate the S Corporation status, when, how long do we have to wait to be an S Corporation again? So this has changed over the years, but right now, the time of this video, you had to wait at least five years. Okay, D, suppose that in B, the revocation was filed on July 1st, 20X6 to be effective as of January 1st, 20X7, but that on September 3rd, 20X6, Goji, Huckle, Juniper, and Rasp decide they want to revoke termination of the election. Or revoke the termination election. Straw does not want to revoke the termination. Can the termination election be revoked? So this is what's going on, right? We're in the current year, all right? We'll call it year one. Actually, let's call it year four. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's not year four. It's, it's year six, right? <laughs> Stupid of me. We're told it's 20x6, so we'll call this year six, and we'll call this year seven. All right, well, the election is made on July 1st of year six to take effect year seven. So we've got this period in between where, hey, a, term, a, a revocation of a termination can occur. Now, on September 3rd of year six, some of the owners, they say, hey, we changed our minds. We don't want to do this. We don't want to terminate S corporation. We don't want to be a C corporation. We still want to remain an S. So remember, when, you, when the termination occurred, more than 50% of the owners had to agree. So what are the rules, are, uh, rules for revoking the termination on 9-3 to make sure that it won't uh, switch over to a C corporation, it'll stay S. Well, you need all owners that agreed to uh, revoke or terminate the S corporation. You need all of them to agree to terminate this and any new owners. Now, we're not told about any new owners in this problem, but we still are told that we have Goji, Huckle, Juniper, and Rasp, and also Straw. Now, we're not told who voted when the original decision was voted on on July 1st um, for revocation of the S Corporation election, but the key is that we know that Strawberry, or Straw, I should say Straw, does not want to revoke. So let's assume that Straw did vote to terminate the S Corporation election. Well, unfortunately, we do not meet the requirements, and guess what? We're bound to be to revoke the S Corporation status. We are bound to revoke that. Okay, so that would happen. Um, the S Corporation would in, would indeed um, switch over, or it would cancel, or it would terminate its S Corporation status because Straw does not is not on board. All right, let's go to problem five. So in problem five, we've got Pulp Fiction Corp. It rents movies and video games online to customers in the U.S. 
Pulp Fiction elected S Corporation status for its first year of operation. Pulp Fiction Corp's common stock is owned by Orange 100 shares and Grapefruit 50 shares. All shareholders are um, U.S. resident citizen individuals. During the current year, Pulp Fiction Corp had the following income and expenses. We've got some items of income, some expenditures and losses. How should Pulp Fiction Corp, Orange and Grapefruit report these items? So again, when you first look at a S corporation, think of it like a partnership because it is a flow through. There are some more there are some more similarities to C corporations and partnerships, but there's many more similarities to partnerships than C corporations with respect to S corporations. So what we're doing here is we're going through all these items of income, expenditures, and losses, and we're going to break them down for Schedule K purposes in page 1 of the 1120 as bottom line, separately stated, and then non-taxable, just like we did for partnership purposes um, when we went through the partnership uh, problems. Okay, So let's go through all these items, and it's the same logic. If it needs to be separately stated, same logic as it would be for a partnership, but you might have some differences. We'll talk about those. So the first is rental receipts. Remember that bottom line is we lump together the ordinary income or loss. Okay, we can lump them together. So rental receipts, can we lump those together? Yes. The general rule for ordinary income is we lump that into the bottom line. What about tax-exempt interest? So tax-exempt interest would be a non-taxable item, right, because it's going to affect the basis, but it doesn't get taxed. It does go on the Schedule K for the um, S corporation and the K1 for the specific shareholder. The gain from the sale of building, which is Section 1231, that's, of course, sec um, separately stated. Short-term capital gain, all capital gains in 1231 are always separately stated. Let's go to the expenditures and losses. Salaries. Salaries are always going to be for an S corporation, consider bottom line, okay? Because they're a normal business op, uh, deduction. Equipment expenses under Section 179. So this is going to be separately stated. Remember, separately stated means you need, it can make a difference depending on the taxpayer. Specifically here, Section 179 is determined, uh, it's, a, it's a limitation based on each taxpayer. Depreciation. So this is an interesting one. We saw in the partnership discussion, the part problem, that depreciation created a separately stated item when we had declining balance. Well, here, notice there's nothing. That's because depreciation is always going to be bottom line. The reason why, well, think why it was separately stated for partnership purposes. It's because a C corporation could own a partnership and we'd have to re report the distinction between straight line depreciation and double decline balance. But for an S corporation, is that ever an issue? No. Why not? Well, maybe you should pause the video and think about it. But the answer is because a, a C corporation can never own an S corporation. Remember the four requirements. You can't have an entity own an S corporation. So that's why depreciation is always going to be straight, um, is always going to be bottom line, ordinary income. Same with rent. Always going to be bottom line, ordinary income. Interest expense is a little um, tricky. You got to look at what the loan deals with. So this is another purchase of equipment, which is actually deals with the business. Okay, so business activity. So this is going to be uh, bottom line. Now, one thing to note is Section 163J. Yes, that's a limitation and it might apply here, but it's applied to business level. Now, if this interest expense was on, I don't know, some portfolio activity by this specific um, corporation, then it would be separately stated because for the taxpayer, investment interest expense is limited to investment interest income based on the taxpayer. The next one is long-term capital loss. Capital losses are always separately stated because of capital loss and capital gain limitations. And lobbying expenses. Lobbying expenses are always non-deductible. So we have our breakdown. So on the schedule, on the Form 1120, right, on page 1, we're going to lump together the bottom line. So we have 198000 here. We've got 62000 which is a subtraction. We've got 9000 a subtraction. We've got 40,000 a subtraction, and we've got 12,000 subtraction. If we calculate that, what you get is $75,000 reported by the S corporation. Now, each separately stated item gets reported on Schedule K as that respective item in the non taxable items. So that's how the corporation reported on its page one for the bottom line and on its Schedule K for those items. But what about the respective owners, Orange and Grapefruit? So for Orange, Okay, the bottom line, this is going to go on their K1. So line one is going to be the bottom line, ordinary income. For orange, we're going to have the 75,000 
reported by the entity. We're going to multiply that by the 100 shares owned by Orange over the total, which is 150. Okay? And that gives us $50,000. So Orange is going to report $50,000 on line one. And Grapefruit, we do the same calculation, $75,000. But now Grapefruit owns 50 over 150, and it's the other $25,000. And we report that on line one. For all the other items, and I'm just going to show you an example. All is separately stated and non-taxable. What we're going to do, let's just take the uh, 1231 gain of $36,000. Okay, 36000 So we report that 1 over 150 for orange, which that equals two-thirds. So that's 24 k for orange. And then for grapefruit, it's going to be uh, one-third of that, which is 12 k for grapefruit. Okay, so we report that portion, and that's what we do. And we do that for all the separately stated items. We give, we give the portion to each and the non-taxable items. All right, so now let's go to problem six, and we'll be done with our problems. So in problem six, we've got Dried Fruit Corp. has a valid S Corp. election in effect at all times since incorporation. So it never was a C corporation, making it easier on the built-in gains tax and the sting taxes. The Dried Fruit Corp. stock is owned one-third by Raisin, and two-thirds by prune. All shareholders are U.S. resident and citizen individuals. At the beginning of the current year, Raisin's basis in his shares was $6,000, and prune's basis in her shares was $2,000. During the current year, Dried Fruit Corp. earned $36,000 of net income. Raisin's share was $12,000, of course, because that is one-third, and prune's share was $24,000 because two-thirds. So that's how you would allocate that if you had to calculate it. What are the results to Dried Fruit Corp., Raisin, and Prune, which I'm going to abbreviate uh, just Corp, R, and P, in the following alternative situations? So in A, on July 1st, Dried Fruit Corp. distributed $16,000 cash to Raisin and $32,000 cash to Prune. So let's do A first. So in A, right, we've got the corporation. We've got the, um, we've got R, and we have P. So on a cash distribution, there's really no consequences to the corporation other than reporting, okay, the on, on line one, this net income of 36000 and it goes it flows to the K1 of R&P. So for corporation, nothing. So for R, we start with the adjusted basis given to us in the problem, which we're told uh, R's basis is 6000 and P's basis is 2000 So we start with those numbers. So 6000 for R and for P, it's going to be, which is given to us as $2,000. We then are going to increase first for the shares of income given to us in the problem. R share is 12000 right, Raisin? And P share is 24000 So that's our new basis before distributions. So that's 18000 for R and that's twenty. Uh, 6,000 for P. Okay, so Raisin gets 16,000 and Prune gets 32,000, right? R and P. So that's the key is that you do this before you take into account the distribution. We always increase. Even though the distribution happens on July 1st, and for S corporations, we assume all distributions take place at the end of the year after adjusting for income or subtracting away for deductions to adjust the basis. So the distribution, right, R gets a $16,000 distribution, which leaves a basis of two, right? That's the remaining basis. Actually, let me reduce, let me take that off. So that leaves 2,000 positive. And then P, we're going to subtract away 32,000, and that gives us negative $6,000. Okay, well, do any of them have gain? Yes, P has a $6,000 gain, which brings the basis to zero. Okay, because you can't have negative basis. So P is going to have a $6,000 gain, and the adjusted basis for P is zero. R's basis, there's no negative here. So R's basis in the stock going forward is 2000 and P's basis is zero, and P has a $6,000 gain. That gain is going to be a capital gain. Okay, that's capital gain. Long term, if held for more than a year, uh, short term, if a year or less, the stock. Okay, let's look at B. So in B, we have a similar situation, okay, but there's one major difference. So the corporation, R, and P, okay, just like before. Now, on December 31st, Dried Fruit Corp. distributes um, Grape Baker, 
which is real property having fair market value of 12,000, basis of eight to raisin, and plum acre having a fair market value of 24 and a basis of 22 to prune. Okay, so this is where uh, S corporations are more similar to C corporations when you're looking at distributions because to the corporation, anytime you have property that has appreciated in value, okay, then you're going to take into account these items. Now, both of the, and you're going to look into and record the gain, which is going to flow through to the owners. And you do this first because if you do it out of order, it's going to affect things. So notice the fair market values are more than the bases, which means it's appreciated. So what we're going to do, remember this rule for C corporations. The corporation is going to calculate this amount realized minus adjusted basis. The amount realized is going to be equal to the greater of fair market value or any liability relief. Now there's two specific assets here. There's no liability, so we're going to use fair market value. So we take the 12000 for Great Baker, that's here. 12,000 for Great Baker and 24,000 for Prune Acre or Plum Acre, I should say, my apologies. And we add those two together and our amount realized, which is the fair market value of both together, that equals 36,000. Okay, that's $36,000. So we add those two together. We subtract away the basis of both items added together, which is 22 plus 8, which is 30,000. So we get an $8,000 gain the corporation has to recognize. Now that gets distributed out to the owners. And let's say that the property to uh, Great Baker and uh, Plum Acre is section 1231. So it would flow on the K1 to the owners. Now we know that um, Raisin is a one-third owner. And we know that Prune is a two-thirds owner. So what we're going to do is we're going to allocate 8000 Right, one third and two thirds. Okay. Make sure I calculated everything here correctly. Yeah, we got thirty six thousand. So one third and two thirds, right? That's how we allocate this. My apologies. See, this is a simple, simple mistake by me, and this happens a lot, right? When you got all these numbers going on, I obviously jumped the gun, and this is a lot easier. Than I made it out, right? I, I write this. Pro I wrote. I made this problem so that the, the numbers work out pretty easy. It's six thousand. My apologies. You're probably yelling at me on the screen. Hey, hey, you did this calculation wrong. What are you doing? Where'd you get eight thousand? My apologies. It's six thousand dollars. So now it's easy. One third of six thousand, of course, is two thousand to R, and two thirds, of course, is four thousand to P. Okay. So now we go through and we calculate what we did before, right? For R and P, we start with the adjusted basis. So those $2,000 and $4,000, the $6,000 a gain, yes, it gets reported on 1120, but it, it flows over to the res re respective owners. So we got the adjusted basis, um, RMP, starting out in the problem, and this is going back to the original, is 6000 and 2000 So we're going to increase for the share of income, and we're going to increase for the gain we just recorded. So the income, again, is 12000 and 24000 That's given to us in the problem. And the gain we just calculated is 2 and 4. So we add these together. This equals uh, 20,000. That's our new basis. And this is going to, before the distribution, and this is going to be equal to uh, 30. Okay, so now each R and P are each receiving land. And that equals a distribution, so we have to take that into account. So this is our new adjusted basis before distribution, so I always put that line there. Now they're each getting land, right? Raisin is getting Grape Acre, and Prune is getting Plum Acre. So Raisin, you, you, you look at the fair market value, right? Think back to our corporate tax uh, items. So the fair market value of um, Grape Acre is 12000 So we subtract that away, and we get fair market value for the adjusted basis. So this is the adjusted basis that the item gets is $12,000. These are the adjusted bases we put in those pieces of property. And that leaves... Adjusted basis to R of 8,000. And for P, the property that P is getting is worth 24,000, the fair market value. And that, we subtract that away, and that leaves us with 6,000. And that's the adjusted basis in the stock left over. So again, the consequences corporation recognizes $6,000 of gain, which that flows out to the owners of section 1231 gain, assuming that both properties are section 12, 1231. 2,000 to um, R, 4,000 to P, which they report on their tax return and they're subject to tax. 
That increases their basis along with income, which the income also goes on the K1 as well, just goes on bottom line versus the other ones, 12, 31 separately stated. Then we take into account, we determine the basis of the items, and we get the adjusted basis of the stock left over for R and P. And that leaves us with the consequences to all the parties. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed that discussion of the six problems. These problems give you a taste of the basic issues of of S corporations. This is meant to be just a basic discussion. If you want more advanced, please go out there. There's lots more available um, on these topics. So I hope you've enjoyed this video.